Paul the Apostle, who considered himself less than the least of all the saints, received the gift of God's grace that he might preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ to make them understand how through Jesus they as Gentiles can now have fellowship with God. The work of God among Gentiles is a blessed truth that God had more or less hid from the understanding of the Old Testament prophets. Though they wrote about it, they did not understand the things that they wrote. That must have been quite an experience to write down something and say, now what does that mean? But we are told that holy men wrote as they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so they did not fully understand the things that they were writing about. It was a blessed truth that was even hid from the angels. The extent of God's work his love and his grace that would be manifested unto us as Gentiles. This truth was given to Paul. The truth that the church of Jesus Christ would be made up of both Jews and Gentiles that being a Jew would no longer have an advantage as far as receiving the work of God. God will work among the Gentiles as well as among the Jews. That the walls that once separated the Gentiles from the promises of God would be broken down by Jesus Christ and the door would be open for all of us. Paul declares that this truth was revealed also to the holy apostles. And as we read in 1 Peter, we see how that this same truth of God's grace and work among the Gentiles is declared by Peter, beginning with verse 3, where he declares, Blessed be the Father, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, phased not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith. under the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through the manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Christ Jesus." Whom having not seen, you love. Though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with a joy that's unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. So notice now here he's on this same theme. The salvation, this work of God's grace, prophets inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of this grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister these things. 
Daniel, as he was prophesying in the 12th chapter, he did not understand the prophecy. And he was asking the Lord for clarification. And the Lord just said, seal it up, Daniel. It is for the time of the end. For in the last days, knowledge will be increased. And this would be the knowledge of the prophecies that deal with end times. Quite often you hear arguments, though they are not really correct. And that is that the rapture of the church is a rather new kind of a doctrine that uh, the early church fathers knew nothing of the rapture. That's not so. There are some very interesting writings of the early church fathers that even speak of a pre-tribulation rapture. So those that make those kind of statements aren't really fully correct. However, The argument is baseless anyhow because of the prophecy of Daniel in the last days knowledge will be increased and this would be knowledge of the prophetic word. It would not be necessary for God to reveal unto say the reformers Luther and Zwingli and these of the rapture of the church because it was an event that they would not be involved with. But I believe that as we approach the day that God is giving a clearer understanding of these prophecies and that which was sealed up in Daniel's time. Now as events are transpiring, we can see how the picture is fitting together from our perspective at this stage with so many of the prophecies now having been fulfilled it it now begins to be very clarified uh, what God is doing and the way God is working it's in fulfillment to the prophecies of the scripture but these men were searching at what time these things would happen the spirit of Christ which was in them Testified beforehand of the sufferings of Christ. They, they did not understand that. They, they did understand the, the glory, the kingdom of God and the glories of the kingdom of God once it was established. They understood the reign of the Messiah, but not the sufferings. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves... But unto us they did minister these things. They didn't write them for themselves or for the people of their time. They were writing them for us, which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Spirit sent down from heaven, which things, he said, the angels desire to look into. Now Paul tells us here that It was God's intention that through the church the principalities in heavenly places might know the manifold wisdom of God. They would know it as it was unfolded through the church. To intent now that under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Prophesied in the Old Testament, yet they did not understand it. But neither did the angels. Now, principalities and powers, as we have mentioned, are rankings of angelic beings, sort of like colonels and lieutenants. And they are mentioned about six or seven times in the New Testament. These principalities and powers are in two factions 
Those that remained obedient to God, the angels that are still obedient to God, and those angels which left that first estate or principle, joined Satan in his rebellion. And so principalities and powers are spoken of in the heavenly places as well as they, those that are ruling in the uh, realm of darkness. So Paul in chapter 8 tells us that our position in Christ is so secure. The love of Christ so secure that nothing can separate us from that love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Nor height, nor depth, nor principalities, nor powers, nor any other created thing is able to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. In the first chapter of uh, Ephesians here, um, or rather in 6th chapter, he speaks about, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against these principalities and powers. In our spiritual battle, the spiritual warfare that we Christians experience against these principalities and powers of darkness. Colossians chapter 2, Paul tells us that Jesus spoiled the principalities and powers. Through his cross, he defeated the powers of darkness, spoiled them. And so uh, they are ranked in the faithful unto God and those that have joined in Satan's rebellion. And these principalities and powers are not omniscient beings. They didn't even understand the scriptures fully that were written by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit by the Old Testament prophets. They desired to look into it. It was interesting to them. And here, God has ordained that through the church and through His work of grace in and through the church, that unto these principalities and powers in the heavenly places might be known the manifold wisdom of God. I imagine that we Christians are a real enigma to the angels. I think that they must be rather shocked at how so often we struggle, we fret, we worry, we become filled with anxiety. Uh, and and I, I'm sure that they're saying, but why don't you pray, stupid? <laughs> I mean, the Lord's told you that if you'll just ask, you know, that you'll receive. If you lack in wisdom, just ask. He gives to all men freely. Why don't you ask him? And I'm certain that they, they just stand around scratching their heads. In wonderment when God has provided so much for us. Has made available to us so very much. And we are not utilizing or taking advantage of those things that God has provided for us, the church. They marvel at God's patience and God's grace towards us. I can see them when we begin to venture out in the flesh thinking that we're capable and we're able to do it and and you know and, and we say take on satan in the in the flesh by the efforts and energy of our flesh and i'm certain that they sort of gather around in amusement and say watch this one now this is going to be a real lulu it's like 
up in Paradise, California, where the Department of Motor Vehicles has given special dispensation to all of the retired people up there that they have restricted driver's licenses that allow them to drive the car two days out of the month. The pay days, you know, when the Social Security checks come and all. And they can drive their cars two days out of the month. And you want to stay off the road those two days. As Kay and I were driving into paradise, there was this car that was sideways right in the you know, four-lane highway, but he had the two lanes blocked, and, and he was sideways in, in the road, and he had stalled, and he, so I put on my brakes and stopped and sort of watched him, and he was, I, when I first saw him, I was like, what in the world is happening there, you know? And, and then jerked on in and I noticed that the car was pretty banged up and he was going into a body shop. (laughs) And where my initial reaction was one of consternation, when I drove and I saw him, you know, and just driving as he was, it turned into pity. And I said, oh, that poor fellow, you know. And then I was talking to the pastor and he told me that they have this special dispensation. There are two days out of the month that they can drive their cars. And he said that part of the entertainment of paradise (laughs) is after the first freeze, when the pavement is slick and icy, they go down to Main Street and watch the people drive in on that day, slipping and sliding around the road. And, you know, it's just almost a shocking thing. You go down, oh, no, watch that, you know. And I think that the angels probably are sort of like that, too, as, as they observe us on slick ice. And uh, where we think that, you know, we are capable and just let me at it, Lord, and I'll show you what I can do. And the angels... Uh, Through us, they begin to understand the manifold wisdom of God and the manifold grace of God and the manifold goodness of God. Here again is one of those places where hindsight gives a real advantage. The prophets who were writing these things were looking ahead They did not understand this grace of God that would be poured out upon the Gentiles. They saw the hints of it in the Old Testament prophecies, but they just did not understand it. And now we upon whom this grace has come have the advantage of hindsight and seeing now what God has wrought, what God is doing. We can look back now at the prophecies of the Old Testament and they become very clear to us. The sufferings of Christ, the prophecies concerning the sufferings of Christ are very clear to us Because he has accomplished it. And having accomplished it, now we look back and we see it from the accomplished position. It is finished. Now that it is finished, this work of redemption through Christ, we can clearly see the sacrifice for our sins. We can see how that in the Old Testament offerings and sacrifices, it was all modeled, it was all Uh, there in type and and now in the fulfillment the substance being there these things are no longer shadowy but now we see in Christ the substance and thus 
we can look back and we can see it very clearly. However, we can understand their problem in trying to, which they did not understand, looking forward to it. Uh, they did not understand it. And uh, thus they, they wrote and they understood that they are not writing for themselves but for us. And uh, it's interesting to me that some of these marvelous uh, aspects of God's grace towards us Gentiles, he even hid from the angels and just let them uh, see it unfold through the church, this manifold wisdom of God. These things remained a mystery until the fulfillment. Now Paul tells us that these are all according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, this was God's plan always. It's an eternal purpose of God that he wrought in Christ. It was something that God planned to do before he even created the universe. In the plan of God, in the creation of the universe, in the creating of man for the purpose of fellowship, in designing man after his image and after his likeness, making man also a self-determinate being, giving man the capacity of choice, giving him something to choose, Respecting and honoring the choice he made. Giving an attractive alternative. And then manifesting his great love. That I might be wooed and drawn by the love of God to the surrendering of myself to him. And to that love. That I might come into a loving relationship with God. That he might dwell in me and I in him. This was a part of God's eternal purpose. This is God's plan before he created it. The universe says such. Now, in God's eternal purposes... In his plan to send his son into the world. God needed to establish a nation through which this purpose might be accomplished. And so God chose Abraham. A man of faith and trust. Took him through the testings of faith. Proved his faith. God promised then Abraham that through his seed all of the nations of the world would be blessed. This is the nation through his seed, his descendants. God would fulfill the purpose of bringing the Messiah into the world who would be a blessing to all nations, Gentiles included. But God needed a Nation to accomplish the purpose. And thus, that nation that came from Abraham. Now, once the Messiah was brought into the world, now God is opening the door to all of the nations. Through Jesus Christ, we Gentiles now have equal access unto God through Jesus Christ. This was the mystery that the Jewish nation did not understand. The prophets, the Jewish prophets did not understand. But through the church it's being revealed because the church is mainly Gentile believers. So God's purposes are unfolding and the manifold wisdom of God in his plan of redemption, in his plan of drawing men to himself 
that they might know the blessing of fellowshipping with God. This was all a part of, of the eternal purposes of God, which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Once the Jewish race had brought the Messiah into the world, they no longer enjoyed that favored nation. But now God's favor and God's grace is bestowed upon all men, Jew and Gentile alike. You are God's favored people. He's chosen to lavish his love upon you. He has chosen now to reveal his eternal purposes through you. You that are drawn by the Spirit of God into a commitment to Jesus Christ. And now the Spirit of God dwelling in you. Your life is now a revelation of God's eternal purpose. Now God always desired that all men should know. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's purpose is that all men everywhere be saved. And so Paul speaks here of those eternal purposes of God. This truth is woven throughout the scriptures. The truth of the eternal purposes of God being wrought out in Christ Jesus and in the church. Going back to the first chapter, verse 4, Paul said, According as he has chosen us in him, when? Before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. The eternal purposes. Imagine, God chose you before the foundations of the world part of his eternal purpose. Titus 1, 2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. See, these are the eternal purposes of God before the world existed. God who cannot lie promised this eternal life. 1 Peter 1, 19 and 20. But with the precious blood we are redeemed, not with corruptible things such as silver and gold from our vain manner of living, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. The plan of God was foreordained before the foundation of the world. The eternal purposes of God were being wrought out in the death of Jesus Christ for man's sin, in his resurrection, and then his calling of the Gentiles to partake and to benefit from that work of Jesus. Luke twenty two twenty two, Jesus speaking of his own death said, and truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined. Acts 2.23, picking up on that, Peter speaking to them of Jesus Christ, who was proved to be of God by the signs and the miracles that he did in their midst, but whom they, and in verse 23, chapter 2, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Now, in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, it was 
part of the determined counsel of God, they fulfilled it in their crucifying him. Does that then release them from guilt? No. The fact that God had determined it, when, when going back to Luke, the case of, uh, it was of Judas Iscariot, Jesus uh, said, Truly, the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. I mean, it was part of the determined counsel, but woe unto that man. So it doesn't let you off the hook. The fact that God had determined beforehand that his son should be crucified does not let those off the hook who crucified him. God has also given to us that capacity of choice and to exercise it and he holds us responsible for the choices that we make. In Isaiah 46, he speaks about God who declares the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand. So God, because he is God, and because his counsel shall stand, can speak of things as existing before they ever exist, because his counsel will stand, and he knows they shall exist. So God can speak and did speak of things as existing before they ever existed. Because he knew that they were going to come into existence. That's part of that omniscience of God. And so God in Isaiah 46, 11 said, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. And I will also do it. So he speaks with great uh, assurance of his word and his purposes. They are going to stand. The purposes, the eternal purposes of God shall stand. So these eternal purposes which he purposed in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Access to what? Access to God. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. But through him we can come to the Father. There's no access to the Father but by Jesus Christ. Those who think or those who claim that they have access to God are sadly mistaken if they are trying to come to God other than through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if a man tries to come by some other way, he is like a thief or a robber. I am the door, he said to the sheepfold. You enter in by me. So many people today Say, well, I say my prayers. I believe in God. I had a Jewish man one time say to me, my father is a devout Jew. He goes to synagogue regularly. He reads his prayer book every day. He seeks God. Do you mean to tell me that just because he doesn't believe in Jesus Christ, he's going to hell? That God won't accept him as a devout, believing Jew? And I said, you know, this is a real problem to me. 
because I realize that there are many Jews who are very devout and very sincere and probably more regular in their prayers than most of you. And they're faithful in reading the scriptures, studying the scriptures. But I said to him, what does your dad do about his sin when he has no sacrifice, no sin offering? God did make a covenant with your people. But in the covenant that God made, he said, if you will keep the words of this covenant, I will be your God, you will be my people. But as God laid out the covenant, he laid out the sin offerings and the sacrifices that would have to be offered in order to have the covering for your sins. What does your dad do to cover his sins? He said, well, we believe now that you cover them by your good works. But I pointed out that the prophet said our works are like a filthy rag in the eyes of God. Our righteousness. And where in the scripture does God say you can now substitute your works for the sacrifices that were commanded in the law? Now, we have a sacrifice, Jesus Christ. And through him, the manifold wisdom of God, we understand now the Old Testament sacrifices. We understand that they were all foreshadowing the sacrifice of Jesus, the Lamb of God, who would take away the sin of the world. And we realize that we have now access to God through him. Not only access, but boldness in our access to God. Paul, writing to the Romans, chapter 5, verse 2, said, By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And then in Ephesians 2.18, which we've already covered, for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Hebrews 4.14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with our feeling of infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. So here again, boldness in this access. As Paul says here in verse 12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. So we can have access to the Father, bold access to the Father. Why? Because of relationship. Oh, what a difference relationship makes. It gives boldness of access. When my grandkids come into the office, they think they own the place. The secretaries don't stop them. They come right to the door and knock on the door. They need a dollar for the Coke machine. <laughs> and that's the kind of relationship you have with God. Where you can come boldly. You have access unto the Father. And this, again, I think is one of those things that the angels marvel over. When God has opened the door and put out the welcome mat, we seem to be reluctant many times to bring the situation to God until it's just beyond our control. It's just, it's, you know, I, it's beyond my abilities. And, and, and God so often 
is the last resort that we seek rather than the first. Boldness of access. Hebrews 10, 19, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. You see, the priest went in with great fear and trembling into the Holy of Holies, into the presence, the Shekinah of God, the glory in the Holy of Holies. He did it only one day out of the year and then after many sacrifices. God was basically unapproachable by sinful man. He had to have a mediator, the high priest that would go in and represent him before God. When God gave the law to Moses, the people understood how that God was unapproachable. They heard the thunder, they saw the fire along the ground and the awesome display of the presence of God there on Mount Sinai. And they said to Moses, you go and talk to God and you come back and tell us what God said and we'll listen to you, but we don't want to go near the place. Well, there was wisdom in that. And, and they later put a cordon around the mountain that someone wouldn't foolishly venture up and be destroyed by that awesome presence of God. We don't realize what a blessed privilege we have in Christ Jesus of being able to come to God. This access that we have through Jesus Christ where we can come boldly to the Father to receive grace and find help in the time of need. Hebrews 10, 21, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Through Jesus, we can come boldly tonight right into the presence of God and find that grace and find that help for our needs. God is inviting you. Surely, surely, we should take advantage of it. Father, we thank you for the open door whereby we, Gentiles, once alienated from your family, outside the walls, Lord, you've opened the door, put out the welcome mat, and you've invited us to come in and partake of that glorious grace, to receive your love, to receive mercy. So, Father, we pray that you'll help us to take full advantage of what you have made available to us according to your eternal purposes which you've purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. May we draw near even as you have told us if we would just draw close to you, near to you, you would draw near to us. So Lord, even now let us just draw near in our hearts unto you we might experience just the warmth of your love that beautiful fellowship in Jesus name we pray Amen